Hello and welcome back to the Double Clutch NBA podcast. My name is Matthew Wellington and I'm joined tonight once again by Mike Miller. Hey, how's it going? Been a while. Been a while. So good to see your beautiful face once more. <laughs> yeah, too it's, long. Been, it's, it's been about two months. Unfortunately, just as I was getting back into like doing podcasts again, I had another uh, another family uh, grievance. So um, I've had a I've had a, a bit of time off to, to just get my head over that and work out what the hell's been going on in the world. But um yeah, it's been a fun year. So back to talking basketball, and I'm actually feeling some sort of basketball vibes the last couple of weeks. So that's a bonus. Basketball vibes, jonesing. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily I've got a couple of other hobbies and things. So like, as much as basketball is basketball, like you know, watching films and stuff is a good distraction for me. But like, imagine if you if you had nothing but basketball, you'd probably struggle. So. <laughs> Yeah, although I, I've decided to take up surfing, so. Oh. <laughs> but that's a different podcast. It's <laughs> totally um, random. Um, if you're not following us already, please do so. Check out uh, at Double Clutch UK on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We're not on TikTok yet. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming Kirk, who's, who's producing this, might end up getting on the TikTok vibe at some point for us. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Kirk's always on TikTok. Okay, it's always on TikTok. Um, and we're obviously streaming this live on Twitch for anyone who is watching, but I don't know who is watching. How do I work out who's who's watching and who isn't? You ask Kirk normally. You, ask no, Kirk. you, you can tell it. You can look at the stream and then click on it. This is brilliant. This is live. <laughs> well, I'm totally new to, to doing this. I, I yeah. haven't had the experience that uh, my esteemed colleague over here in the Chicago Michael Jordan MVP top has. <laughs> all, all six um, of them. All six of them. Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's been so much going on the last few days. We had a great uh, Denver Clippers game six last night at a really great time. It was on at, like, what, six o'clock UK time? and Amazing time. It was getting some real buzz. And over the last few weeks, you've seen natural, you know, NBA topics trending on Twitter in the United Kingdom um, at reasonable hours of the day, which is which is cool because normally it's at, like, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. when most people are asleep. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was cool to watch game six and to watch that sort of chaos unfold yesterday watched the clippers break down um mentally and physically <laughs> it was quite amusing to watch and just to see twitter just completely going i mean i mean i put out a tweet and said this is over you know get ready for the west conference finals and then half an hour later i you know i was feeling a bit stupid so sure there were plenty of people <clears> on. um but obviously we, we, we go, we're going to talk western conference finals matchups later but none of that's been decided and tonight's the first night where there hasn't been games in what like a month something like that <laughs> well probably uh, there was a there was a couple of days break after the regular season ended wasn't there yeah uh, yes. the regular season the seeding games so what would that <laughs> have been that would have been 30th of july plus about 18 days let's go with the uh 16th of july yeah um but anyway we're going to get on to our main topic of discussion <laughs> today what are you laughing at man <laughs> just because you're like yeah whatever mike just carry on <laughs> just move on <laughs> Hey, it's, 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 cool. it's cool being ropey. I got to get into game form. Um, we're going to talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. I mean, the, the biggest question is after crashing out to the Miami Heat, what the hell is going to happen with Giannis now? Twitter kind of exploded on Saturday as as everyone noticed that he'd unfollowed dozens and dozens of people on his Instagram feed, and then he'd unfollowed his his teammates as well. And I think it had gone down to eight people by the last time I checked. Um, might have gone down even more by now, but he's he's just following his brothers and and his wife and one or two one or two other people so read into that what you will um it's easy to overreact but then since then basically we've he's had a meeting with the bucks and they've they've said that they're going to go into the salary cap and you know the luxury tax and build a team around him so mike um i guess the question is do you think the bucks can actually fit a team around janice or is milwaukee always going to be one of those markets where you're never really going to get get anybody well, the thing is, they're going to need to trade to get anyone. And yeah. what are they going to give up to get back in return? Because that roster is... The, the roster, there is some talent there, but there's also some massive holes that uh, no one's going to want. Uh, who's going to want um, Robin Lopez for five mil for two years at this point in his career? No offence, because I, I do love Robin Lopez, but he's just a very expensive towel waver um, at the minute. <laughs> and, you know... Uh I, even even to the if he is really serious about a championship, then they also need to look at getting guys off the books like his brother Fanasis, because mm. you know when it comes down to it, 
you, you've got eight key guys and he's not going to be one of those eight key guys. Um, but I guess they'll keep him to, to keep him happy. Um, I just, I, I am struggling to see where they go from here. So they definitely need to rebuild around him. Whether they can is another thing. Yeah, I mean, no matter how you slice it, the Bucks are kind of strapped for cash next season. And obviously, we still don't know when the, the new season is going to um, tip off. December was rumoured, but now that's still up in the air. That was obviously impl- implications with the salary cap and what happened at, with China at the start of the season and obviously financials now for the teams and the fact that there's no revenue coming in through gate receipts and merchandise sales and things like that in the arenas. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what the Bucks can do, but the only way they can do anything is to make a move. And if you're going for somebody like Chris Paul, then you're going to have to give up quite a lot to get him because someone like Sam Presti is not going to let him go for, for cheap. I mean, we saw what sort of Hall Houston had to give up to get him a couple of years back. And then the same again, just, just recently to get him over to, to the thunder. Um, and I'm not entirely sure the Bucks have got anything like what either of those teams, two teams had, to offer in return. Um, I mean, I guess you could, Eric Bledsoe, somebody whose name has been floated around, but what value does mo- do, do teams really see in, in Eric Bledsoe at the moment? I mean, good defender, but offense, you're getting nothing. We've well, had nothing from him in the last two seasons. The, the economics don't work for Chris Paul. He's going to get 41 mil next season. He's going to get 45, I think, 44 and a bit the season afterwards. Mm. He is 35 now. So, the amount they'd have to give up, I mean, Bledsoe's only got on a 15 mil contract. I think he's on it for the next four years, three years. Middleton's on more. Uh, I think he's on about 30, and that's another four years. But if you're the if you're the Thunder and you're clearly going to rebuild, that's why you've already split from your coach. Like within days, um, Donovan's gone. Um, you're going to rebuild, so you want to get Paul off the books. But where's the economics going to work here? Because the amount of players they're going to have to sacrifice to get Chris Paul in. Is, is just huge. Add to the fact that everyone is going through an extreme case of recency bias now, going, Chris Paul is still the point guard. Like, he has been great since the season restarted, but let's not forget the last three seasons or so, he's struggled with hamstring issues, he's struggled with being available all the time, and he's not getting younger. I don't yeah. think Chris Paul's the answer. I think he is the answer in a vacuum. I don't think he is the answer economically and in terms of putting this team in a better position? Well, if you're not going to get a player or you know a relevant player to come back in, do you look at someone like moving or getting rid of Budenholzer and bringing in another, another coach, somebody who's perhaps a bit more inventive on the offensive side of the ball so that when someone like Janis is, is stunted in the playoffs by you know the opposition's defence, they have a plan B because, and, and you guys have spoken about it on recent podcasts, it's, it has just looked like they played the regular season game, they played their heart out for every regular season game, which a lot of teams haven't done, like the Clippers, for example, just you know cruised through the regular season just to get into the postseason. Um, but unfortunately, they don't, have, they don't seem to have turned that switch um, back on yet. But do you, get, do you get yourself in a situation where you bring in, I don't know, Mike D'Antoni's obviously just said he's not coming back to Houston. Maybe you bring someone like him in and you try and reinvent the offense around Giannis and you bring in players who fit that system. Unrestricted free agent wise, they've got Kyle Corver, Pat Connington, who could leave this summer, but I'm not too sure what value you get from bringing them back. Um, but obviously it all depends on what philosophy your team's going to be uh, playing next year when it comes to who who's the coach. I mean, this whole sort of space drive space thing that they've been they've been using obviously doesn't work in the playoffs and teams make adjustments when they play you over a couple of games so you have to find a way of of getting around that and i think it's probably a coaching you know opportunity uh, rather than bringing in a player who can who can change that for them i I think there is some there are some players out there that they should maybe make inquiries about whether they'll get them or not is another question like for me they need a playmaker right Mm. Someone like Bledsoe disappears far too often. Um, they need someone as an alternative to Yanis who can create. Chris Middleton has not been able to do it consistently in the playoffs, though he has been pretty solid throughout the regular seasons. Um, in, in my mind, I think playmakers, I think someone like Ricky Rubio, but again, he's not an outside scorer, so that's going to shrink that floor. Um, so I'm thinking, what what would they have to give up to get someone like Drew Holiday? 
But I get that he's going to be a key culture guy in uh, New Orleans for a couple more years at least. But if the offer's good enough, they could probably turn the reins over to Lonzo Ball and let that, you know, mm-hmm. that, that Ball Williamson duo just sort of try and uh, you know grow and ferment a bit more quickly. Um, but they'd still have to give up a, a decent stack to get to get that done. They'd, they'd have to give up Bledsoe, which is fine. Get rid of him. <laughs> he's, pretty, he's, pretty, he's proven what he can and can't do. Um, Ilya Sova, who's just a stiff. Uh, I think he's got a couple more seasons left on his contract. Uh, Lopez, who's got a couple more seasons on yeah. his contract. Uh, I'm talking about Robin, not Brooke. Um, someone like Dante DiVincenzo, because the salaries are so low at that end that it takes a lot to get it up to where it needs to be to make the, the transaction work. But in terms of coaching, what Bud did this year was make everything they did before more or less better and didn't address their weaknesses. Mm. I kind of feel like he's earned enough stock to have another go at it. But it's whether the front office will trust him with this crucial Yanis year coming up. D'Antoni yeah. is actually, a, I'd almost swore that is a great shout from you as a potential. Because look at the way he engineered an entire offense around James Harden as being the playmaker. Now imagine Yanis in that role. So yeah. Harden, yeah, okay. So Harden obviously hits those step back threes, crazy like whatever. But they've got four guys just spread out. The one thing Houston didn't have is a versatile big, which is exactly what Yanis would give you. So I could see something like that working. I think it's batshit crazy, but I could see something like that working. Yeah, it's, and he and he's he's got a proven history of just trying to invent something that nobody's ever seen before. Like he did hmm. it with the Phoenix Seven Seconds or Less Phoenix Suns, you know, with with Nash and Stoudemire. And then when he went to Houston, everyone was like, "What the hell's going on here?" He tried to do something in New York with the the sort of crumbling talent that that franchise had at the time but that didn't work out too well um but when he went to houston i mean he he took this team to as close as they were going to get against you know a (laughs) dynastic side like the golden state warriors so they they did everything they possibly could i think you're right they could give him more time um but i think i I mean we go on about it i was watching um the, the jj reddit podcast earlier and they they had kevin durant on actually and he was talking about everyone goes on about the fact that you need two or three stars and they mentioned Janis had two stars. And I was thinking, well, does anyone really consider someone like Chris Middleton to be a second star type player that can take the burden off Janis? Um, I mean, he's had, he's not had many opportunities to do that, but I, I think going back to Chris Ball quickly, like he would come in and be somebody like that. He is a facilitator and somebody who can unlock a defense when a team's struggling, you know, when Janis is struggling and he does everything you need him to do in terms of thinking on the court. Like you have a an additional coach who supports what Budenholzer is calling from the sideline. And I think that would be a massive help for them. You'd also end up running a lot more pick and rolls through Giannis and, and Chris Paul. And that's something that if you, you you sort of deep dive into the stats a little bit, Giannis hasn't really been a, a pick and roll player this this last few seasons. And he doesn't score many points through through that. So I think if you if you added someone like Chris Paul, who's, you know, got an ability to drain a three, can hit a mid range, can drive at the rim and force, you know, turnovers. He's, he's a sort of guy that I, I think on paper fits perfectly. It's just, you have to give up so much to get him. Um, so that's the question there. Are, I don't really know what they can do. The answer is just, we just have to wait and see it. it you know, Janice can use all of his, his, what is it? His, his might to see how far he goes, but it's a critical period for the Bucks. They have to take advantage of this next season before you know he has a chance to 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 leave them. Because if if Milwaukee proves that they can't seriously contend, and let's not forget they're in the Eastern Conference, it should be easier to contend in theory. Being out there, you don't have to go through some of the teams that are traditional powerhouses in the West. So they they should. But you know, getting fooled by the likes of Miami, who didn't do anything too serious, they just did a lot of stunting, which is something that. Janis might get used to, um, but obviously that throws him off his stride. And somebody like Janis, the, the the you want him running head head first into into the paint and trying to cause havoc. And when you when you've got Miami, you know, stunting and faking it, sort of defensively pump faking him, I think is the phrase. Um, it throws him off, and he doesn't quite know what to do. So that's Janis has got to get better. He's got to get a three point shot because you can't be the best player in the NBA or whatever and not have a three point shot. Um, and he just needs to get more consistent. So it, it's an all-around thing. I think Giannis has to take as much of this on himself as sort of the Bucks do, because you know they, you know, they proved they could play when he wasn't wasn't on the court. So 
I, I don't know how Take much more consistent down. Yanis could be. <laughs> All right. What, what do you want from the guy? He's giving you like 28 and 12 with six or so. But, they, you, like, but, but you need a three-point shot. He, he can't not yeah, have... Yeah, so he, he needs to work on his outside shooting for sure. But like, the guy's consistent. Like, and this is this is one of the things that's. What's your take on the 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 Yanis conversation that's come up saying that he needs an MJ to his Pippin, or he needs um, uh, Batman to his Robin? What's your take on that? I I think he would. You know, he could be a, a number one or a or a. I don't know. I don't want to say it, but a Scotty Pippin type guy. Like, I don't think it would really bother him. But I think that's why you have to look at a, you know, a facilitating point guard or guard type player who can just come in and and help him. Someone who's going to take a bit more of the the burden. Chris Middleton, as great as he is, he's a very, you know, he's just a guy who, on paper, you you don't think of as being a, a guy who can take over in the playoffs. So. They need somebody else who can go out and, and do that. And they need to look at their situa- their their sort of cap situation because they're probably spending too much money on guys who are at the far far like the far end of their bench rotation. So they need to work out what's going on with with the finances as well. But like I said, there's I mean, they've got nearly a hundred million time sort of tied up in the team's top five players. And so there's no reason for us to expect them not to be here next season. But if you move one of them, you're going to have to try and get real value back for it. I mean, it seems like the only options they've got is to see if they can get any role players or bring people in on sort of the mid-level exception. So see, I don't know. I mean, what does John Horse do? If John Horse gets a call from Bob Myers and Bob Myers says, would you be willing to talk Janice? Do you, do you accept that? Do you, do you, do you, you know, no, even you sign in your own war? You, you never trade a generational talent. You never trade a two-time MVP. <laughs> He's going to be two-time MVP. Why would you trade this guy? Like, if you trade him, you will never get back his value. That's why it's so difficult to bring in talent. Yeah, you... Like, this this whole, he could be the Pippin, he could be the Robin to someone else. I just find it infuriating. He's the reigning MVP. He's going to be an MVP again. Right, in your opinion, is he a top 10 NBA player? Yes or no? Top 10 NBA player. Yeah, but I I don't know if I'd put him at the top. Uh, the the that's all right. I'm, top said yes, yes, he's up, top up ten. Can't believe it took you that long to say he was top ten. <laughs> is he a top five NBA player? No, no. Who are you putting above him? Uh, well, I've thought my head right now. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a list of eight that I prepared. <laughs> uh, so are you, you're putting KD above him, I assume, assuming he's fully healthy. KD that we know and and loathe sometimes. Um, you put Kawhi above him, assuming that he can actually play something more than sixty games, um, which you might actually change your mind on if he can't deliver anything with the Clippers at the end of the series. Who knows? I'm just putting words <laughs> in your mouth. You put LeBron above him, despite the fact he's thirty six. Yeah. You put AD above him. AD and Jokic probably. Yeah. You put Jokic above him as well. I uh, think Jokic has got a r- real all round game. He's... Would you put Embiid above him? No. Would no. you put Luca above him? Oh man, I, I might just put Luca. Oh, well, so I don't know. Bearing in mind, we're talking about the reigning MVP, who's about to be MVP again. Would you put Dame above him? Mm, no. Okay, so so we've got a group of potentially six players that you think he could be the secondary player to. How many times do you think we see a team that has two players who are top six talents? Rarely, if ever. You've, you've got AD and LeBron now, potentially. You had yeah. Steph. I mean, not you mentioned Steph, who could be back, who would be a perfect complimentary player because he can play off the ball as well. Yeah. But you, the, the point is, for me, you can't say a top six player could, could be the second fiddle because it so infrequently happens. It's, it's just like, it's just, it's ridiculous. It is literally 2K. It's like, okay, I'm going to go get the second best player in the league and then I've got, I'm going to win the chip. It doesn't work like that. There's no way it'll happen. Well, if Bob Myers calls me, I might just, you know, try and sneakily suggest that he sends us Clay Thompson and not that we send him Janice, because I think Clay would be a a great fit in that system. And you mm-hmm. could probably send someone like Chris Middleton back and that the Warriors might not lose all that much considering if, the type of player he is. But if Bob Myers did that trade, I would lose a lot of respect for him. <laughs> He's the coolest GM in the NBA. Nobody we, loses we, respect for Bob Myers. We've had a Oh man, someone's saying he's basically Scotty Pippen. I completely disagree with that. But shout out Red Rocket for following. 
um, Jamie NH has said, I think Jamie's a, a Cavs fan because he suggested that they could get someone like Colin Sexton or she, or Sheddy Osborne alongside him. Uh, Sheddy Osborne's not too bad, but he's at a really early stage of his career. So Neither of them are the stars that are supposed to deliver this. <laughs> no, but they're, the, they're the nice role players that we were saying is the, probably the only realistic opportunity they've got of making any moves this summer, but... I I I just think they're in a very 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 difficult position, and if, but if they can't do something, and they don't break the bank for something, he he will go. I don't know how they would feasibly do it, right? But I'm just thinking, jumping ahead to the next topic and thinking, what's going on with Houston right now? What if Houston just go, screw it, we can't do anything with this, we'll blow it up. So every every, every single Houston Rockets player is. Is open available. for trade. Is available. Why Anyone not? on that Jesus roster that broke, you go, so he's going to need yeah. to save some money somewhere. <laughs> Anyone on that roster that you, you know, Robert Covington, does he, does he become your third star? star he's not a star. Player? No, he's not I don't. Star. Does he become your he's third a very good player, player behind, behind Chris not... Middleton? <laughs> I, I, I just he can't create his own shot either. I think I think they they need someone who is a creator and a playmaker. Um, and if you James want to Hart. start getting yeah. someone in who's ball dominant as well, like a Chris Paul, then Yanis is need to going to develop. So, yes, I know Roko's a legend. <laughs> I mean, I'm reading the chat as it goes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Roko's a legend. I'm not arguing that. He's just not a star like that. He's not the kind of guy who mm. is going to be the upper echelon talent on on this on this team. I, honestly, if you need you need. If you're going to get a, you need a ball creator, someone who can create your own shot, but you also need Yanis to develop his off, off the ball game because that's non existent at the minute. No, it, it, it isn't there. And in the modern NBA, I, I generally don't think you can succeed without one. So he's going to have to, he's going to have to get one somewhere. Even if he just shoots the league average, that would be nice. And, and then you just build around him and do that. Maybe the other thing is don't take the bloody regular season so seriously. Like you're in the Eastern Conference, you've got the best player in the Eastern Conference. Just roll just roll through the Eastern Conference, get to the playoffs, you go in as the second or third seed or whatever, and then do a bit more, you know, use your use your coaching brain and try and pull something out of the book that nobody's done before. How less seriously do you think they can take it? They rested him basically half the game. <laughs> The, like I just uh, no, I'm not buying any Yanis slander at all. Like I get that he needs to develop a jump shot, but a consistent jump shot. But he no, like they 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 coasted through the season. I genuinely think um, something that's not been discussed is the impact the break had on them because it completely halted their rhythm. They never looked themselves when they came back to the bubble because they never had to. They already had locked up the one seed. They just yeah. it was just never. We've we've gone on on Giannis for for a long, long time. But then, but then you've got a lot. You've got a lot of players in the bubble at the moment. It was saying the way the courts are and everything in Orlando is favouring you know the shooters. So you know you'd think a team that was loaded with shooters like the Bucks would have had a higher chance of success. <laughs> hey, I, I this bubble's been crazy. I, anything can happen. I was surprised they went there. My picks come out of the East. Um, even when they were down, yeah, I, I thought they'd still come back. The way Yanis played on that that ankle as well, I don't know what more he can do for people to just stop, like just <laughs> nitpicking with him. Like, I get the jump shot bit. That's it. That's the only bit I can fault. Mm. I, th- I think you need to get like a I love Giannis T-shirt and roll with it. I've got his jersey there. <laughs> it's, it's on camera. Do you, I've got I've got another T-shirt that's basically the jersey in T-shirt form. Custom T-shirt. That's what we've got to do. Mike Miller, <laughs> Janis, Janis Antetokounmpo it isn't his fault, Stan. Um, <laughs> moving on. Houston Rockets. Um, so on Sunday night, basically, Mike D'Antoni announced that he wasn't going to come back to the Houston Rockets. Um, and I, I don't know if this was a surprise. I mean, this is a team that's consistently got to the final rounds of the Western Conference and always stumbled at the final hurdle. Um, so I guess the biggest question is what's next for Russell Westbrook, James Harden and Maury Ball really because it could be the end of an era. Have we had an era in Houston? I, I don't know if we have but um, it, it could be the end of an era if we if we see them just blow everything up. I mean what do you think there what was your instant reaction to Mike D'Antoni saying he's, he's not coming back? Was it oh thank goodness I don't have to watch that awful basketball anymore or 
No, because I've, I've enjoyed this. This yeah, you uh, are the last few months yeah. since, since they traded and got rid of anyone over six foot nine. I've enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I it, it is an end of an era, hundred percent. Uh, and the minute they hired him, I I, I mocked it, um, but it worked to a, you know within a fraction of being a finals team. Within I say a fraction. 26 consecutive missed threes in a uh, conference finals game against the the Warriors, um, I think is slightly more than a fraction, but you know, um, they they have been perfectly designed for Harden. It just hasn't worked. It, it just hasn't been able to get them there. Um, I know we're going to talk about, but there's a listener question later on that I really want to dive into, but I... I don't know where they go from here. I'm intrigued to see what Harden will be like in a different system. I'm not surprised he left. There's obviously the upheaval with Tilma Fatita and just his his assets himself. There's obviously um, Maury and what's happening with him. And, you know, we're only sort of, well, I would say 12 months away, maybe 11 months from the, the China tweet um, or the Hong Kong tweet. <laughs> so there's a, there is internal t- turmoil there. And I kind of feel like, you know, he, he's, he's overseeing this ship. And they've been constantly changing in and out players, you know, quick, quick turnarounds from what Chris Paul was there two, three years, maybe. Um, and then switched him out for, for Restbrook and um, basically nothing changed. But it's just not the right. It's just not the right superstars to play alongside Harden, in my opinion. That was a ramble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... I mean, back when probably one of the last podcasts I was on was just after they'd made the, the sort of moves for for Russell Westbrook, and they had you know they had some success against the Lakers in the regular season. Um, but I think it comes down to the fact that they just couldn't match up when it came to size. Um, they didn't have anybody who they could put on AD, and the Lakers went small at some stages of that game. If you can, you know, believe it, it seems a bit stupid, but. Um, you can't have Russell Westbrook coming in, firing 27 threes, making seven of them. Like that, That is not helpful at all. Um, I noticed when I was watching some of the games live is that when he was more aggressive and was driving to the paint, they played better. But he started sagging out and started taking bad shots and it was all downhill from there. They also, for, for someone who we've literally just spent you know five minutes praising, Mike D'Antoni, he didn't make too many adjustments when it came to trying to get them back into this series. I mean, in game five, he started running that sort of high screen and roll for hard and a bit further out the top of the key. But by then it was, it was too late. And <laughs> it was that funny clip where you had LeBron on camera and Russell Westbrook was inbound in the ball and said, you better double me. You better double me. And LeBron sitting there laughing at him. And I just thought that two second moment summed up the whole series. It was like the Lakers are taking everything as seriously as possible especially after being one of the two teams that said they were going to boycott. It's almost like they've said, right, let's just get this over with so we can go home and see our families. Um, and they've they've been on a mission ever since. But I, I, I don't know what Houston does. I mean, you can keep going with this lineup next year and see if it has some success. Maybe you try and bring in a, a big who's just going to help you when you do match up against teams that have got some some size. But it's not, not the ghost of Tyson Chandler. No, it's not been a total failure, has it? So it's a, it's an awkward one. Uh, we had a question from Rich Barrett actually just in the chat. So I was hard on the problem rather than, than the solution. Um, I'm not convinced he is. I certainly think that's the narrative attached to him. And certainly mm. I've, I've joined in, in the, the hardened bashing over the years, but I kind of feel like he's a product of the system and the environment and whatever this harden is, is a, is like a magnified mutation of him as an actual player. Um, yeah. I, I, they've had injury issues as well. Like Westbrook's uh, obviously injured, and then before that, Chris Paul, the second star, injured, and it does fall to Harden a lot. I just think in in this instance, the only adjustments uh, D'Antoni could have made is to give the guys like platform shoes or something to give them extra <laughs> height. I, <clears throat> the question coming up in a bit. I I I'm spoiler alert. I I don't think this experiment is a failure at all but I will get into that in more detail, I'm sure. No, I think we saw a small sample size and perhaps without the... Well, I I mean, it was weird because when the break happened, everyone was like, this is going to benefit the Rockets. They'll get some extra rest. But they obviously didn't get as many games during the regular season to sort of pan out and work out what they were doing and how they were going to do it because 
uh, it's just been just been one of those weird years. But I mean, they got absolutely killed on the boards. They got out rebounded by the Lakers. I think the Lakers grabbed sixty two percent of the the available boards in the last sort of two games, and that that really that just that doesn't just kill you in terms of like your morale but you don't get any second chance points from that as well so you struggle to come back from deficits which is where they were stuck for those sort of final two games rebound is overrated that's the conclusion <laughs> i'm coming to it's overrated i'm getting I'm get, I'm, I'm, the more and more i read advanced analytics stuff which just take me you know four hours to read three paragraphs because i have to read it seven times just to <laughs> understand it and i've got a really slow reading speed apparently um but <laughs> rebounding um is is team rebounding is is good, but individual not so much. Um, just got like offensive rebounding. Everyone's over, like realizing that that's overvalued, and we don't get people um, crashing the offensive boards as much anymore, um, except for Stephen Adams. And I just think I don't know. I just I'm, I'm not buying it. This is this this team. It feels to me could still be like. Um, the same way the Suns were for the Warriors and the Suns were for this iteration. They are the next step in the evolution, but not quite there yet. Yeah. I think they actually showed more progress when Chris Paul was in that lineup because Chris Paul, unlike Russell Westbrook, is can actually help space that floor. Whereas the way Russ has been playing recently, he just doesn't he just doesn't open you know, but, open up those spaces for James Harden to play his game, really. But Clint Capella was there, so he shrank that floor again. Mm. Do you know who they need? They need MVP Ryan Anderson back. <laughs> I'm just going to stand for Ryan Anderson now for the next 10 minutes. Ryan, and- Ryan Anderson got a whole chapter in Sprawl Ball, which uh, you know, is well worth a read. But um, <laughs> yeah. at, at one point, everyone was like, why on earth have we, they, the Rockets paid him all this money? But in the end, it worked out pretty... Well, it was working out well for them <laughs> until until he, he sort of lost his shot. But yeah, they, they, do, they, do, they just need more guys you can knock down that three. I think Daniel House going home didn't really help them. He was one of their best players off the bench. So, you know, sneaking a COVID official back into your hotel room during the middle of the playoffs against the Lakers, probably not the smartest thing to do. Um, I know that was something that we were going to get onto later, but uh, I had to bring it up now because it's just... Ha- too- has it been crazy. confirmed as a COVID official? Because I heard I th- that was... I thought uh, it was just a COVID official. I'm just assuming. I don't know. <laughs> I, I heard that that was... That was um, untrue that that was their role in this but uh, i don't know what the actual role was but um what an idiot it was a f- yeah <laughs> what an idiot the 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 the, 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 the si report just said a an official like it didn't say anything else so who knows we, we can we can speculate <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't had more players dobbing each other up actually like night like before massive games just saying look i saw you know i saw ad out last night getting a takeaway by the by the fishing pond or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you won't get any now either because Chris Paul's gone. So the <laughs> snitch line's just been disconnected. Snitch, snitch line's just gone. <laughs> um, but uh, I, generally, the Rockets. I mean, they they could blow it up, and I wouldn't be surprised. They could carry on with what they're doing, and I wouldn't be surprised. I think they, you know, give them another year, get them more used to each other, see see how far you go next season. <laughs> It all depends on what happens to Maury, because if it's Maury, they're going to run it back with some tweaks. Obviously, yeah. he'll go all out to try and get another star. I can't see him going back to a more traditional lineup because he's kind of thrown all his chips in here. It's just whether Tillman Fertitta decides to keep him. I don't know why I keep saying Tillman Fertitta either, because it's a stupid name to keep saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. I, I, it, well, ha- having, having read even Sherwood Strauss's book, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Daryl Morey right now was was working out a way of signing Giannis Antetokounmpo via trade. Like That's the sort of crazy-ass guy that Daryl Morey is. He always looks at trying to get the impossible. Swings the fences. Yeah, and there's a whole slight paragraph in, in Ethan's book about how he was like he spoke to Daryl and Daryl was legitimately trying to sort something to try and entice um, Kevin Durant, who I obviously know was a, was a free agent, but same situation. He, he he likes to swing for for things he thinks he can get, and if he gets them, then he looks like an absolute genius. So we'll have to see what happens. Um, anyway, less of the Rockets and and more more random things. Um, Steve Nash is now the the head of the Brooklyn Nets. This is an interesting one because there's, there's there was obviously other candidates, and Steve Nash got it without having any real head coach experience. Um, but he was a heck of a player. He does have a great relationship with Kevin Durant. I imagine he has some sort of relationship with Kyrie Irving. I don't know, but what do you think of um of uh, 
Steve Nash joining the uh, the Brooklyn Nets as their head coach. Do you do you reckon it's championship or bust for them this season? <laughs> Uh, I, I think they'd give him a bit longer than one season. If it, it's a bit of a high bar to come in as a rookie head coach and winner, yeah. uh, and, unless your name's Steve Kerr. Um, <laughs> but it's actually Nick Nurse as well. Um, so apparently it's not because that's that's the two last championship winning coaches. And in fact, Ty Lue as well. So the last three NBA. You coaches, just have to be a player. That's all that matters. Well, just. Well, Nick Nurse wasn't really an NBA player, was he? He was no, uh, no. <laughs> he played for the Derby Trailblazers uh, and the Birmingham Bullets back in the old days. Um, <laughs> but rookie head coaches apparently have all the look. I think it's a, a good pickup. Your point guard is supposed to be an extension of a head coach. He's supposed to be the on-floor coach to see as everything unfolds. Um, and that's exactly what Steve Nash is, one of the most cerebral players in NBA history. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if he, he gels with Kyrie because he's one of those players he's got a bit of an interesting personality. But Steve just, Nash gels with everyone. <laughs> is it just because he's Canadian? He just they it's just get so on. So nice. It's, it's, it's Canadian. They just get on with everyone. Yeah, led um, the league in high fives. That's all you need to know. Apart from when you insult them when it comes to hockey, don't do that. Bad idea. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting one. I I, I wouldn't be surprised. Whoever's going to coach that team is going to get some form of instant success. You've got. Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Chris Levert, you've got a really strong roster there. You know, guys like Joe Harris are going to chip in. They overachieved in the remaining games of this season. Um, massively. Massively. Should have been and, there. Massively overachieved. And, and I think that that's that's only a good sign for them. And with Kevin Durant coming back, you, you'd like to hope that he's, you know, the same player he was when he when he left. And he was arguably, you know, one of the, the best player in the world, you, you could say. So um, we'll see what happens. Um Rookie of the Year, John Morant won Rookie of the Year during the time that we were off. Obviously, we didn't do a podcast last week because you were on holiday in a cabin somewhere in the woods with no Wi-Fi. That was stupid. Some 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 Wi-Fi, but not enough to do anything decent with. <laughs> the playoffs one. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, well, well, the playoffs weren't on when I booked it. <laughs> there was no season when I booked it. There was no season, yeah. I actually, I, yeah, it was a couple of days after the season stopped I, I booked it. But yeah. <laughs> so we we streamed NBA 2K instead, but uh, that's that's why we weren't here last week. For those of you who were um, who were asking, um, John Morant won Rookie of the Year. I, I think completely deserved. The, the the kid's got so much talent. He makes Memphis a team that people actually want to watch, which is an achievement in itself. Um, apart make from them more popular than when they were good. Yeah, then when yeah, and you know we're big Zebo <laughs> we're big Zebo fans here on this podcast. We've had a lot of Zebo chat over <laughs> over, the, over the years. So you know anything good in Memphis is good by me. Um, along with their jerseys, which are what some of the best in the NBA at the moment. Which I said when I was oh yeah, I see oh, yeah. when we were talking with Kurt last week, we went over some jerseys and they were one of our uh, our mutual favourites. So it's I, it's 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 got to be upwards for for Jam around now. It's just a case of taking your time. I mean, he, he could end up being one of the best point guards in the league. If you, you look at how easy he, he adapted to the game and to the league this season, mm-hmm. he's got pretty much everything. So yeah, um, completely deserved. The Raptors randomly um, may have to play in the U S next season, but I guess it's not that random when you think that Canada's got different COVID restrictions to um, the United States. At the moment. I mean, what do you think of this? Do you think this would be a advantage or a disadvantage? Cause I imagine quite a lot of their rosters probably from the States anyway. Well, it, it really depends on what the league's going to look like next year because they're talking about opening back up to fans. So yeah. if they're now going to be playing at a neutral arena without their hometown fans, then they're going to lose whatever home court advantage might look like next year. But other than that, if, if, if it's I mean, if there's no fans, what difference does it make? Well, it's it's they're one of the teams that has a you know significant home court advantage, but if yeah, no, so that's what I'm saying. So if there are no fans, it doesn't matter where they play, essentially. The only issue would be that they are not based at home. So they yeah. have the inconvenience of being stuck in a hotel for however many games the season is next year. But if there's no, if there's no fans, then on-court shouldn't make a huge difference. If there is fans, then yeah, I can see there being a, quite a big difference. Yeah, well, I guess it's all based on where, like how, how, it, you know, how the pandemic sort of plays out in the states at the moment and and whatever happens with the election and and things like that and how you know each candidate takes a a different approach try not to touch on anything i can see your eyebrows going um but yeah the nba has informed the teams that the season won't begin before christmas day so we're gonna have to wait a while anyway and then it's just a case of 
at how well is your COVID situation and what we gonna how, what can we do around it? I mean, I don't think any of the players would agree to another bubble, if I'm being honest. For a whole year? No way. <laughs> it depends how much money's on the line, doesn't it, really? Well, well, yeah. if, if, <laughs> I was, if, if the choice is you don't get paid or you get paid it, but in a bubble, I bet a lot of them would take that because mm. these athletes, with, with the financial uncertainty right now and the actual opportunity uh, in terms of their, their window of opportunity for earning vast amounts of money is, is tiny. The average NBA career is, is four years. So if you think about some of the rookies this year, they've had half a season. Um, they will have an interrupted season next year. That could be half their career and yeah. just done. Well, I guess they've learned a lot from this bubble as well. So it could be a case of it's a bubble, but it's a bit more expanded. So you have, <laughs> you can have families in there a bit earlier and a bit sooner than they did when it came to to this bubble, obviously the test in which the NBA was one of the te- one of the organisations that you know, along with Harvard, I think it was who helped mm-hmm. sort of develop the rapid testing, which is now being spread out all over the world by the looks of it. So um, the NBA has done some, you know, more than more than good um, with that one. But yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, silly nonsense topics. Mike's favourite part of the uh, the podcast. It's not my favourite, it's Kirk's favourite. <laughs> oh, oh, it's Kirk's favourite. I, did, I didn't know this. <laughs> this, is a new th- this is a new thing. This is a new thing anyway. Uh, yeah, thanks Kawhi. Um, but we, we've mentioned Daniel House. I mean, did you watch the Anthony Davis interview the other day with Kai Kai, the dog from SI who decided to start barking during the middle of AD's presser? Um, <laughs> it was rather amusing. AD didn't have a clue what she said. He was just, he, he said all I heard was rough, rough. And then the I didn't have a clue what she said either. Uh, <laughs> and I watched it twice. I was too busy listening to the dog. And then LeBron yelled over, the dog asked you a question, bro, which I thought just sealed it. So um, that was interesting. Um, we had another random thing from, I think this was from Nick Whitfield. Do you think Mike, Mike D'Antoni leaving the Houston Rockets jeopardizes his lifelong, lifelong endorsement as the face of Pringles? Also, can you think of any other NBA personalities that look like confectionery or confectionery linked characters? <laughs> I'm I'm just fact checking myself here because because I know how robust Nick is with with being on this on the is, mark with this facts. This is the most Nick Whitfield thing ever, I think. But it, Mike D'Antoni, I'm pretty sure him leaving Houston won't impact any potential marketing uh, with Pringles on the basis that. He probably stuffed that up himself the minute he shaved his tash off, which feels like two seasons ago now. He's been tashless for two seasons. He's no longer the face of uh, Pringles. That that would have been that's it. Like that clause has been uh, activated. You're gone, mate. Um, I think someone else suggested um, Kurt Rambis, and I'm pretty sure his tash is gone too. So. <laughs> We're just picking. Um, we're just picking any any coach we can remember with with tash. What we're doing. Basically. I mean, I didn't. I, I I didn't actually think Mike D'Antoni looked like the Pringles tube until I saw the Pringles tube earlier on, and then put an old photo of Mike D'Antoni next to it. But um, tube tube genius has just said a certain former head coach looks like Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! But that, that, that's that's the most Nick Whitfield thing I think I've um I've ever seen in my life. I I did try and think of someone who might have another. Um, you know, resemblance to something, and I really struggled with it. And the closest, and it's a really bad comparison, but the closest I could come up with uh, would be Jokic and the Harry Bow Bear, which I think would be a disaster if it ever came to fruition. Because if that guy got his hands on more Harry Bow, <laughs> then he can already get it. <laughs> when we were when we were doing some research for our like Euros um, posts, we, I I did I just Jokic has got a weird background, dude. Like. He was playing basketball. He almost quit by the time he was 13. He wanted to go into professional horse racing, which That's look mad. At, looking at the size of him, you think, what the fuck? <laughs> ride like two horses simultaneously because yeah. uh, simultaneously because I'm English. Um, because w- w- there's no jockey over five foot four. He, there's no way that guy could. That horse would be. Was he going to race a Shire horse? What are those ones you have up in Norfolk with you? You have those giant ones. <laughs> I mean, uh, how silly is that? <laughs> I, I, but uh, Jokic's yeah, story yeah, is brilliant. Yeah, I, I love the fact he still gets beaten up by his older brothers. Yeah, but it was like it's, it's. He wanted to do horse racing, so he goes back to do basketball. When he joins his first professional club, wherever it was, it, he couldn't do one press up, so they put him on a massive strength and conditioning program. And during that time, they had to wean him off the four liters of Coca Cola 
that he was drinking like every day of the week, which just seems completely bonkers. Though I had a friend, I have a friend, Sam, and he used to drink a hell of a lot of Pepsi, but I don't think even he drank four litres of Pepsi every day of the week. Like, that's just, uh. ugh. <laughs> you must feel so uh, rough when you do that, man. Like, yeah. uh, I have one can of Coke now, and my face starts to feel like it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Is that because you're an alcoholic uh, type beverage <laughs> these days, or...? To be, well, to be fair, it usually has um, a certain bourbon in it, but um, you know, I don't drink Coca Cola that often. I still, I still think we need to approach Brewdog with this idea about you know NBA related beers for their expansion into the US market when they're selling their craft ale. You know, we could come up with some really good names. I think so. Yeah, you could for, for each city. Yes, no, I think we should explore this more. Um, everyone out there who's uh, streaming at the minute, don't steal that idea. <laughs> Uh, yeah, go on then. What's the next thing we're doing? Well, well we normally do talking uh, uh, discourse on Discord, but I had a che- had a check of the Discord, and there's there's nothing out of the ordinary that has occurred this week. There's been a lot of NBA 2K slander because of the shooting, mm. because the shooting is, uh, for want of a better word, a bit wank, uh, <laughs> and because <laughs> you, you you have to get your release right, and then you have to get your aim right, so you can be off left or off right or center. And I think 2K are trying to patch it. Um, yeah, it's being patched. And it's been patched today, and I haven't had a chance to play it yet. But Well, yeah. I-, I thought I'd give you guys a week head start before I started playing it, obviously. <laughs> well, um, I saw I that last week. And, and downloaded it um, and, and had a game on, oh man, was it Saturday? And I, I couldn't okay, even make really. a free throw. It was, right. it was horrible. It's, like, it's horrible. And I was so excited for it as well, because in principle, I think it works beautifully. The concept of it... Because it makes it more like having to shoot a, a a shot in basketball. You have to get the release right. You have to get the balance right. Uh, you have to keep the elbow in, everything like that. And I just love the idea that you were somehow translating it into the game. Um, at least that was my interpretation of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. It, it, I, I, I sucked. I sucked so bad at it. I could, I I could... Catch an air ball. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it was a lot of air balls. I thought I was getting the hang of it in uh, the 2KU section as well, and uh, then I got into a game, and I was like, nope. No. It, it, it's it's weird, because obviously that changes depending on where you are on court, and we were saying this when we did the um, 2K stream last week. Like, First of all, the learning curve with 2K is, is why a lot of my friends don't like playing it, is because you have to learn each player's release in the first place. You have mm-hmm. to know which player is good at what shot. So you don't want Shaquille O'Neal taking a three-pointer. Like it just that is not something you want. Um, and you have to learn all of that. But then you've got to put onto the top of it where you are on the court. You know, if that's a hot zone for your player, if he should be taking shots from there, if he should not be taking shots from there. And then you've got to add in the release and the aiming. And it's just all like Joe Hulbert nailed it earlier on Twitter. Actually, he was saying that it's almost like it's been geared towards pro players. Um, so and I think that's a great way of, of looking yeah. at it. I yeah. think that's what we should all aspire to be. I, I, I struggled <laughs> with it, but it made me... I, I still want to learn how to get better. I'm not going to ditch the game. I, I want to learn how to do it. And I think... No, no. I mean, the, the whole goal of it was to create a, a, a skill gap, essentially, so that you could differentiate yourself from standard players or vice versa. And, yeah, I think it's... Um, I, I, I Like I say, I like, I like the idea behind it. I've struggled with it, but I'm, I'm going to crack on with it. Yeah, and it's it's like everything. New changes in games just take time. And I think that 2K are gearing up for a massive next-gen upgrade, update. So, you know, we'll get more used to it when we start playing it in that. But it's it's just one of those things. It's a teething issue. I think Madden's had the lowest user rating ever for a sports game. So, you know, it, it, you know things could be a lot worse. Um, but the, the base game is still, you know, the great game that it always has been. They've just changed a couple of little things and it's throwing people off um i was waving at mo saying goodbye not not, not you just to freak you out um but yeah i think well there was no discourse in discourse but there's been plenty of um there has NBA, been plenty of discourse M- nba 2k discussions yeah um at that point you should probably remind people to go to discord.me slash double clutch and come join the discord god you're good it's almost like you've been doing this for the last two months <laughs> <laughs> he's on fire because I'm still doing this thing where I don't know where the camera is, or the camera's up there, but I'm looking over here, and uh, 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 this is just all over the place. <laughs> one, one day I'll have a, one. One day I'll have one of those streaming setups that um, that Kirk's got. That looks funky with the buttons. The Starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, moving on. Discord list of questions. Um, 
do you want to? Shall I just read these out and then we'll answer them together, or do you want to do one each? Or oh, there you go. On. Let's 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 uh, let's do them together. So, fine tortoise, who has been a listener for a long, long time, um, do you think that small ball as a concept has been put to bed, or do you think that it is still has some merit? <laughs> I don't think it's been put to bed. I think if the Houston Rockets re-roll again, they'll be doing it next year. Teams are playing small ball throughout these playoffs. And, you know, you had that series between the Raptors and the Celtics, and it was basically all small ball at stages of that game. So I don't think it's something that teams are putting to bed at all. It's just one of those things that's become part of the sort of modern NBA, you know, logic, I guess. Is it logic? I don't know. Yeah, no, it, well, it's... It... The, the sort of substance of the NBA, the way the game is. Um, I don't think it's been put to bed at all. In fact, I think it's actually sort of, um, God, what's the word? Accelerated the next phase of it. Developing. Because, yeah, yeah we, we look, the Golden State Warriors won that with a death lineup, which was the, the the first, you know, massive success of a small ball lineup. Their, their average height was like six, nine and a bit. So small ball is a relative term. We're talking basketball players here. Well, the average height is still about six foot six. So they're still above average for NBA players. So they're still tall guys. What we had here was a like hyper small ball where the tallest guy was six foot nine. Um, I think it's underscored its value. And, you know, it's all analytics based, whatever. That's fine. I get it. Threes spread the floor tends to be that the short guys are better at shooting from outside and they're better with the ball. That's fine. That's just that's just very, very rudimentary and crude way of looking at basketball. <laughs> um, but it emphasizes the depth of limited big men in the league for me. Yeah. It's like you, you guys like JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard had lower minutes this 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 series. They couldn't stay on the floor. And you okay, you won without them, that's fine. But they that those big guys were gone. The same with uh Steven Adams. What what is his point in this series against it they it gets rid of the big men off the floor. And the only way you can break it is if you have someone as versatile as A D. Like someone who is able to step outside, yeah. someone who's able to dribble. So, and, and, and that's it sort of just emphasizes again the importance of the unicorns in, in the NBA. You know, that, that old favorite word that was used about three, four years ago. These unicorns, they're the X factors in this league. Couldn't name drop him again twice now. You mentioned Joe earlier. Joe, when he you know, was a long time host of this show, one of the things he, he said was the next phase of small ball is going to be just a slightly taller version with versatile big men. And that's exactly, you know, that's exactly what will break small ball is people who can do what the small guys do, but are bigger. And that's yeah. exactly what we've seen. So I, I don't think it does it at all. It's just sped up the next phase of it. Well, there's a couple of teams that are on their way to that as well. Like Dallas is one of those teams that's got a lot of maneuverability, but also a lot of length. And, they, they, you know, they've got guys who can, who can take it inside and take it outside, especially with Chris Stapps and, and Luca. So it's it's like, you know, Luca is, he was listed as a forward coming out of Europe, but he's basically he's played guard throughout the whole of the, the NBA, you know, the NBA season so far. And it's, it's weird seeing somebody who, who's got that build playing point guard, but we, you know, it's like, um, Reddick was saying on their podcast earlier, like the, the league is so positionless right now that nobody cares. Like you could be a center and play point guard if you want. It doesn't make a, it doesn't make a difference. And that's why, you know, what we were saying earlier about, Janice, you could have a coach come in and go and be like, right, we're going to play you here and play you there. And then that's the sort of thing that throws other teams off. So it'll be interesting to see. But I don't know. I don't think small ball has, has gone away at all. I mean, I remember back when the Heatles were still, get, were, you know, were the thing and they, they started playing small ball. And everyone was like, oh, oh, what's going on? But now, you know, teams have, have adapted that and developed it. And the Warriors obviously perfected it a little bit. So. Yeah, I think I've been called out. Uh, so Jamie NH just said, OKC okay, used small ball versus the Rockets. And just to clarify, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. The reason they used small ball is because the Rockets forced them to because yeah. Stephen Adams couldn't stay on the floor. And ultimately, it worked for the Rockets because they went through as, as close as that series was. Yeah. At times. And the problem, Houston, the problem Houston had against the Lakers was that when they did play small ball, AD was the guy playing small ball. So you still need someone who can, you know, go outside with him and defend him in the post, which is, you know, a rare, a rare player to find. Um, okay, your question. Oh, you want me to read it? Oh, I thought you just okay, fine. Uh, I thought we were swapping. Okay, <laughs> fine. That's fine. Uh, so this is from Hoopin and Luton, Elliot. Uh, what will be the biggest series rivalry-wise? The Battle of LA, assuming the Clippers get through, obviously. 
uh, or Lakers versus Celtics. Is there a danger of the championship series being a lesser event than the Western Conference Finals? Um, I think Battle LA would would be media crazy if it was in LA, um, but it's in a bubble at the moment, so it's going to be a big matchup. You know, whatever happens, but Celtics Lakers has got however many years of history behind it. I don't think there's you know th- there's very few rivalries in American sports, but that is one of the true rivalries that you can compare to something that you have over here in the UK and in Europe when it comes to football. So, um. I, th- I think that whatever, assuming that it's... This is assuming of, Boston get to the finals, but... Yeah, normally I would take this as a... Well, it's assuming that the Clippers get to the conference finals as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> normally I would take this as an opportunity to bash people over the head with why we should abolish conferences. <laughs> I'm not going to. Um, <clears throat> so I think either way you win. If, it, if, it's, if it's the Clippers versus the Lakers, that's going to be fantastic. And then if, assuming the Lakers go through that, if even if it's the Heat rather than the Celtics, they they are two fantastic narratives because of the Laker history and then because of LeBron's relationship with Miami. I think um, quite often we do see the Western Conference Finals should be the main event and isn't. Um, yeah. But I think there are a number of scenarios here where the finals could actually be really, like really, really good. Yeah, the last few years it's been different because you had like Golden State and Houston going at it in the Western Conference Finals and they were quite obviously the two you know most fun teams, best teams or whatever and there was nothing really coming out of the Eastern Conference that compared to that but the way Boston have been playing, the way Miami have been playing like they're going to make a fight of it whoever ends up in the finals so I mean that's a, that's a heck of a series as it is but you know Lakers-Celtics is just it's, it's something something special about that like even you know you go to you can you can go to your non-basketball friends and they might know something about Lakers Celtics just because it's a bit more, I don't know, what's the word? Like mainstream sports type hype. So, yeah, I, I, we can't win. Like, you can't can't win, can't lose. Um, I just think it's going to be, you know, great basketball, whatever we get. And even if the Nuggets go through, like they've been playing some good basketball, but if they have to go 3-1 down again, then <laughs> it's going to be a bit weird. I think we'd lose if it was a Nuggets Heat final because I don't think the general populace would be interested. But... Right, they wouldn't care. That's like a basketball nerd. So you like, you know, what's Gary Harris doing tonight, sort of thing. Um, shout out Gary Harris. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, about three minutes left, so we're gonna have to yeah, start I, before I was, Kirk shouts at us on the screen again. I was reading that. Um, top uh, top three t- Tom Hanks movies is probably going to take too long. Uh, it's not really. I've written okay. mine down. Go, go. Uh, but generally because I'm absolutely crap when it comes to films and haven't watched any <laughs> films in ages. So I'm going uh, in reverse order. I'm going Big, Forrest Gump and Turner and Hooch. Poof. Wow. Okay. Um, there you go. So you obviously haven't, uh, you obviously haven't prepped for this one. That's no, how quick was, the answer should be. I was just trying to think, but I, I, you know, Tom Hanks has done a lot of good movies. I mean, Saving Private Ryan's up there, Green Mile's up there. Philadelphia's up there. That's a good yeah, film. Yeah, not seen um, any of them. Carry no? on. Okay. No. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> This one's from this one's from this one's from Shaq. You you guys have done some real cool things involving basketball. Has there been one moment you've had to pinch yourself and take a step back at what you're actually doing? Um, NBA London for the first time for me was pretty cool. Um, speaking to Peter Vesey was actually the like the first point where I was like, "Ooh, this is cool," because you know Hall of Fame NBA journalist. That was that was a moment, and he'd had some run-ins with Carl Malone, so he had a lot of good stories. But that was that was like episode fifty something. That was bloody years ago um and a lot of the events since i've missed and, and mike's gone to the, to those so I, I imagine it'll be the events <laughs> yeah it's always the events like even things like uh the crossover event the first one i went to in shoreditch i got to speak with steve nash that was yeah. like pretty epic but i wasn't weirdly i wasn't phased by any of the players i've really met the only time i've suddenly gone holy crap was actually uh 2017 NBA London game when the Pacers were playing the Nuggets and we were walking, in fact it was Mo and I were walking through um, the back from the media area underground back out to the, the court and we were stopped by security who just sort of held us back and then opened the door and waved someone through and it was Larry Bird and uh, Larry Bird just sort of went <laughs> thumbs up and he was literally like as close as I am to the screen right now which is touching distance away from me. And Mo, I'm pretty sure he was texting on the know, knowing how switched on he is. He was probably <laughs> telling everyone what he was doing that at the exact moment I had met him. I, I was trying to tell Mo, who's a Celtics fan, it was Larry Bird, and I couldn't even talk. I was just sort of stood there going. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was my pinch yourself moment. Yeah, no, th- we've had some really cool moments over the years, and I'm hoping there's, um, there's many more to come. Um, 
before we go, uh, conference finals, series predictions. Um, okay, we'll just do Boston Miami because we ain't got a clue about the other one yet. So, Boston Miami, who are you taking? Should we, should we do it on three at the same time? Should we do one, two, three, and then say um, yeah, team if, if and this... number? Team oh, in oh, X. Oh, okay, yeah. So, right. it would sound really bad on the audio, but you're ready to make, <laughs> so. so, am I counting? Yeah, go on, go on then. We go one, like when we do the clap beforehand, that never works. We're going one, two, three. <laughs> One, two, three. Heat. Miami in seven. Oh, of course. You went to it. Bring on it. I, uh, it it's, it's an interesting series, and I'm taking out my Lakers Celtics bias here. But um, if Jimmy Butler takes the next step, I, they, they could really do some damage in this series. And I think their defense has just been phenomenal. Um, I guess I guess you look, if you look at it for the Celtics, if, if Gordon Hayward comes back, then that's another weapon that they're going to get. And it might help them, but I, I think defensively Miami are just, they're on it. They're, they're dogs. Like they're, they're, they're up for this. They are the team that I want to win it all. I think now mm. just, I, I just think Massive the story is great. Yeah. The, 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 the feel of the team, the way they're playing is fantastic. I would love for them to win it all. Yeah, no, that, that'd be, uh, you know, and the, the Celtics might have out, might have overdone themselves playing that Raptors series. Cause that was, um, that was a, that was a war. Um, six players every like hit 50 minutes in a game yeah crazy um but anyway thank you everyone to who's um who's watched us on discord tonight thank you to everyone who's who's listening um what else we got to do we've got plenty of things to do please check out the website doubleclutch.uk there's been loads of um fantastic articles up there recently we've had some, several new people join the team um and if you are interested in in helping us out and doing nba content in the uk then um there is a tab on there called called join us um Latest followers. I'm on the, there we go. I'm on the wrong so, Do you want me to do it? I've got it here. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. shouts on Discord to Dansoft Tube 17, UK Raptors fan, <laughs> Jordan Aitken 91. Ah, oh, no, I've got to say this here, one now. Here you go. Say, can you look at in? Can you look at something like that? Look at uh, and Richard Fang H. Remember, it's discord.me slash double clutch. Come join us, join the fun uh, on Twitch. Obviously, Hoop Genius uh, and Red Rocket who joined tonight. Shout out to you guys for, for joining. We'll see you next time, I'm sure. Yeah, no, it's been fun. Uh, I'll know where to look. I might know where to look next time. I don't know. I'm still peeling about like some sort of moron. Anyway, I'll get this edited and get this out. (laughs) Cool.